the Holy Bible says, And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Verse 18, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee then henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Let's pick up in verse number 21. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Um, Uncle Joe Childs, can you pray for us this morning, please? Amen. You may be seated this morning. I was thinking about this passage of Scripture, and the first thing that stuck out to me was he left and he went into the city of Bethany. If you look and study, uh, Bethany is a dear place to the Lord. Bethany was where uh, Lazarus lived, was where Mary and Martha were. And uh, I look at this setting, and I was thinking to myself that the Bible says, he lodged there. You say it's a very simple phrase, but I believe it has very deep meaning. That means he stayed in Bethany. And he stayed there not for a, um, a long while, but he stayed there enough to, I think, recuperate and rest. Uh, I love, and I think about this, when I, when I sat down and looked at that phrase, he lodged there, what I thought about is the maker identified with the creation. I want you to notice that the maker identifies with the creation, meaning that this God, this great, powerful, and loving God came down to man's level. One of the best biblical illustrations of this is the potter and the clay. It is one of my most favorite. God is the heavenly potter who interjects for the sinful man to bring redemption to the sinful man. The potter makes something out of nothing. You look at the illustration that Jeremiah gives us. He went down to the potter's house and went to a dark place, went to a desolate place, went to a deep place to take something that was worthless, something that um, uh, was no, of no value and brought value to it by making pottery. The potter forsook his place for the clay. You know, we look at these stories in the Bible and we read through them and we think to ourselves, oh man, there's of no significance. There's no depth to it. What is the Lord trying to tell us? And the Bible shows us that the potter, the potter forsook his place for the clay. Can you imagine in all of eternity, God the Heavenly Father had uh, the mansions, if you would. Uh, and the Bible says, I go to prepare a place for you. He had the glories of heaven, the splendors of heaven. He had um, the, the streets of gold and the riches in, in heaven. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ forsook all of the splendors of heaven to come identify with sinful men. He forsook um, the, the, the beauties of New Jerusalem or the beauties of heaven, if you would, to start uh, uh, um, uh, a relationship with sinful men. Uh, back in the olden times when the potter was to make his pottery, he would forsake Jerusalem, the four walls of that city, and he would have to go out to the city because he had to start a fire. And that fire, when uh, it would heat up and he would uh, heat up that clay, it put out such a foul smell that uh, the people within the city would complain. So the potter had to leave his safety. He had to leave the things that he loved and the things that he knew. And he had to go out of the city and he had to make sure that the fire was safe. And he had to leave towns, the comforts of his home, to mold the clay. And he didn't just work on any piece of clay. It was a special type of clay. The potter got the clay himself. 
He didn't send an individual to say, Noah, go outside and dig a hole, and once you find a piece of clay, bring it to me. He didn't say, Daisha, any piece of clay will do. He said, uh, I'm going to go out. He went, uh, I, I love how the song goes, out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. Only his great eternal love would make my Savior go. He left heaven to go down out of the potter's place into uh, a different place uh, to find the best clay that he could. Most of the time, the clay wasn't at the very top. And so the potter had to de uh, dig deep into dark places, into desolate places, into dirty places to find his clay. Uh, I love that old southern gospel song that says, He came to me. Yes, he came to me. When I could not go where Jesus was, he came to me. The potter came to me. The potter not only forsook his place for the clay, the potter not only found the clay, but let me lastly say this, the potter fashioned the clay. This is Jesus Christ identifying with simple men. You say, what do you mean by the, the potter fashions the clay? The potter molded the clay and made it to where he wanted it to be. But uh, I came to find out through my friend, Brother Cody Zorn, he was telling me about uh, a book in, in the old country, how they would fashion the clay. And potters, when they wanted to make a, a piece of clay, a piece of um, pottery stick out, what they would do is they would slay an animal. And they would take the blood of that goat or that animal. And as they're working onto their pottery, they would take the blood and mold it into the clay that gave that clay that distinct look. The potter made marks on the clay. Uh, the potter... Uh, knew his piece of pottery because he was the one who fashioned that clay. But he, he, he did something to where the, it, it was unique to him because he stained that piece of clay with blood. He took something that was useless, something that was worthless, a piece of clay, and then he took something that was valuable, the price of a goat, the price of, of a life, and he fashioned the blood into the clay to make something no, 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 hear me out. Listen to this. To take something that was worthless and make it something that is valuable. You say, why did you say that? Because it's much more than just a potter. I want to tell you about my Lord Jesus Christ. He took something that was worthless, something that was invaluable, and he applied his blood to something that was of no use and made something worthless into something valuable. The Bible says, For he hath made him to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of Christ. The blood gave the clay distinction. It marked the clay and gave a look of the clay to the eyes of the potter. The, they called that the potter's mark to where the potter would look at the clay, Brother Bob, and he would say, man, I know that clay, that is my own. But Uncle Boy, he would say, that is, that is my piece of work. That is mine. That's valuable to me. And just like that, the Lord Jesus Christ does the same for us. He says, boy, boy, that is my child. He has a distinct name, and I know his name. Uncle Philip, he came to a place... He came to a place, the place Bethany. And the Bible says that he lodged there. He identified himself with sinful men. Not only was it distinct, but it was a deterrent. Deterrent. Uh, they found that when you would work on pottery and you would apply the blood on the pottery and you would run it through the fire, the, the, the blood-stained piece of clay, once it fold, uh, or formed into uh, the clay... Uh, the, the pottery, once it formed, that, that piece of pottery, if it had blood on it, would be able to withstand more heat, would be able to hold and contain more heat than just a regular piece of clay. It became strong and it became durable to the place that if you uh, were to damage it and, and try to damage it, it wouldn't break that easily. And so that's the same thing Christ did for us. He applied the blood so we can withstand the heat, if you would. We can withstand the heat. You get what I'm saying here this morning? Say amen. Lastly, let me say this in the point of the potter and the clay. 
What's interesting with the potter and the clay is he notices his work, and when his work would be damaged, when there was a crack, when there was a, a, a blemish in his pottery, uh, and, and it had blood on it, the, 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 the person who bought the pottery would bring it back to that specific potter. And they would say, there is a crack in my pottery. And that pottery is too valuable to just throw away that the potter would look at it. And what he would do is he would take these little ticks and he would pull them off of the animals. And these little ticks had little blood on it. And what he would do is he would squeeze those live ticks and take um, little pieces of clay. And he would work that tick and the tick blood into the clay, and he would take that little piece of clay and work it back into the pottery that he had made to bring it back to value again, to remove the blemish, to remove the cracks. You say, why did he do that? Because I have cracks, I have holes, and I love that the blood of Jesus Christ comes in and fills in those holes. I love how the potter doesn't just discard the clay when the clay is cracked. The potter works on the clay and makes it even more valuable. And this God um, from heaven identifies with me, a, a meager man. He comes to a place and it summarizes Christ's humanity. Look at this in verse number 18. In the morning as he returned into the city, going back to the place he had left, the Bible says in verse number 18, he hungered. That sum summarizes, that summarizes um, Christ's humanity. The hunger that Christ faced. He faced hunger in the desert, in the wilderness in Matthew chapter number 4. He had the simple needs of man in Mark chapter number 11 and verse 12. Famish, figurative, figuratively to crave. The Bible says he faced the temptations of men. Uh, the Bible tells us that he was fed and fed the, the, the hungry multitude with five loaves and two fishes. Jesus points out hunger and the hunger shows us the simplicity of man, the humanity that um, man has and the needs that man has. Even in the resurrection, Christ talks about his hunger, John 21. Yet the Lord delivers promises of never feeling hungry in John 6.35. Uh, if they were to come unto him, the Bible says that they will never hunger again. He experienced the pains of hunger. And he turns to the fig tree and he looks at that fig tree and he says, man, I want a piece of that fig tree and there's no fig, figs on it. Uh, the only tree that Christ cursed is the fig tree. Uh, you look at that and it's a picture of the unbelieving Jew. It's a picture of the Israelite self-righteousness. It's a picture of um, the awe at the withered fig tree. What faith can do even greater. There are different trees in the Bible. There's the fig tree, the olive tree, the vine tree, the bramble, the cedar. And you look at these uh, trees and you look at these mountains also in the Bible. I was looking at, uh, as I studied this passage of Scripture, the place Bethany. I looked at the humanity of Christ. I looked at the place where Christ lodged. I looked at the hunger that He faced. I looked at the tree that He had cursed. I looked at the mountain that He uh, looked at and He said, uh, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea. There are uh, four distinct mountains in the Bible. Mount Moriah, the Bible shows us, the place where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac. Mount uh, Sinai, the picture of the law. There is Mount Calvary, the picture of redemption, where Christ died for us. Mount Zion, the picture of heaven. I love that old song that says, And I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill. Uh, there's mountains and all of these things. And, and, and the Lord does something that's very interesting to me. And I look at this passage of Scripture and I started to think uh, a simple question. Let's look at this again. Uh, Matthew 21 and verse number 21. Matthew 21 and verse number 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also, if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. So why do I as a Christian, why do I as a Christian need to look at this mountain and think to myself, I need to move this mountain? Why do I as a Christian need a picture of uh, the power of Christ where I can move mountains? 
the, uh, move mountains. The point is Christ is not making us, or, or the point that Christ is trying to make is that moving mountains is a simple picture. Number letter A, moving mountains is a picture of answered prayer. Moving mountains is a picture of answered prayer. That's what the Lord is trying to do. Look at here, verse 22, at what He says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. That's the picture Christ is trying to show us, that if you ask Him in prayer, uh, He can answer prayer. And the picture is He can answer it in such a way that it's like moving mountains. That's what Christ is trying to say. Uh, a picture of God answering prayer. God, uh, I remember when I was a kid, my mom and dad always instilled it in me that God answers prayer. We would sit down by the bedside and mom would pray beside me and she would sing an old song that goes, God answers prayer in the morning. God answers prayer in the noon. God answers prayer in the evening to keep our hearts in tune. Okay, go to sleep. That's what my mom would do. But you say every night she would come into my room and uh, when I'd lay down and I'd lay my head to rest, my mom would say two questions. Did you brush your teeth? No, mom. So I would go and brush my teeth. I'd come back to my bedside. And then she'd say, ah, 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 ah. What? What's up, mom? Did you pray? Oh, and then I'd get down on my hands and my knees and I'd say, dear God. And I would pray, and, and then right after she would sing that song, God answers prayer. The, 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 the principle is simply this. God can answer prayers. Here's the problem with the Christian. God answers prayer, but in a lot of ways, not in the way that we want Him to answer our prayers. Okay, there's three answers. Yes, no, not now. Right? And a lot of times it's wait or be patient. And a lot of times we as Christians, we get fidgety. We think to ourselves, no, Lord, you need to give me a yes or a no. I'm making my plans. And God says, just wait. Right? And, and so the picture we see here is sometimes your prayer will not get uh, answered in the way that you expect it to get answered. But what's the principle? The Bible says that if ye uh, uh, are to have faith, not doubting, and to keep praying. So that's the principle. You say, I didn't get my prayer answered the way I thought it is to be answered. So this is what you do, uh, Christian. Keep praying. You say, but, but I didn't get the answer that I wanted. Okay, Christian, keep praying. There's a story in the Old Testament. The prophet went to go heal the child. Or, or, or what he did is he sent his servant to go heal a, a boy. And, and uh, the servant went over there and he had the faith and he tried to heal the boy. And the boy never woke up. The boy never woke up from his death, from his sleep. And so the, the, the servant of the man of God went back. And, and so I think it was Elisha. He goes to uh, the, the, the boy to try and heal him, to try to raise him up to life. And what does he do? He leans over there and he tries. He prays over him. And the, 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 the man of God tries to do his work, but the boy doesn't raise up from the dead. And so what does he do? He stands up, he starts pacing, and he says, okay, what should I do? I should just keep praying. So he goes back and he keeps praying and he keeps praying and he keeps praying until the boy resurrects from the dead. You say, I'm not getting my prayer the, the, the answered the way I believe it is to be answered. Christian, don't worry about then that. Uh, th then, then, then don't worry about that. Just keep praying. And God will move and God will answer in his time. I think of a young lady uh, by the name of Emma Blankenship. I, I had met her and her family uh, when I was up in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, this, this young girl was a woman of faith. And every year what they do for their missions conference, they have missionaries that come in over the world, all over the world. And uh, they have those missionaries talk about their field and the work that they're doing in the different fields. And Emma was there. And uh, every year that they would have their missions conference, they did something called a faith promise. Okay, what that, what that was is they, um, um, every week the church takes up an offering, the faith promise offering, that's a designated specifically and only for missionaries. And missionaries are people who go out and preach the gospel. Like we looked at this morning, you and I are missionaries. We're local missionaries. But these guys that I'm talking about, they're um, missionaries that leave. Uh, and, and they go out to different places and they preach the gospel. And in this passage, or, or in this story, uh, they, they took up a faith promise. And what they do is at the beginning of every, or at the end of every church, um, at the end of every missions conference, they tally up how much people had um, decided that they were going to 
donate for the year until next missions, um, um, uh, the next missions meeting. And uh, what they would do is they would encourage Christians to write down the amount that they were going to tithe every week, that they were going to give to the Lord every week and, and give towards missions and see if they could fulfill that commitment, fill, fulfill that promise. And young Emma said, for a year, I'm going to donate $5 every week to missions. This girl didn't have a job. This girl didn't have um, uh, much of a, um, what's it called, allowance. But she could decide and committed to her heart that I am going to give. And she said, the Lord is going to provide. Now watch this story. Emma decides that at the mission conference and says, I'm going to keep it to my heart, and I'm going to pray, and, and I, the Lord knows the amount that I'm going to give to the Lord. And she told her parents how much she was going to give, and she decided in her heart that that's what she's going to do. Her mom came into her room one time and noticed uh, and, and overheard her prayer. She got down on her knees and said, Lord, Lord, and, and, and they said, uh, she prayed this prayer, Lord, I promised that I would give $5 every week. I fell short last week. And this week, I don't have enough money. I, I'm missing money. I, I have $10. I, I need to tithe $10 to my missions giving. Lord, I know you can provide. This is where her prayer was. I know you can provide. Please provide. So that was on a Friday, that, that, uh, or that was on a Thursday. That Friday, the next day, they got a letter in the mail. Letter in the mail. And in that uh, letter was, um, oh, sorry, excuse me. That was on a Friday. And then on a Saturday, she went over to uh, Salvation Army and went into the store and uh, was trying on some dresses and was thinking to herself, I can't afford this dress, but, uh, but Lord, uh, I, I would like this dress, and Lord also, I need to give to my missions giving. That's the thing that was on her mind. And so she puts on the dress, and she slips her hands in the pocket and finds a $20 bill. Finds a $20 bill. And uh, she goes over to the counter and gives it back to the person at the counter, the cashier. And she said, where did you get this? She said, I found it in this dress. Uh, and there's a $20 bill that uh, I need to give back. It's only honest for me to give back. And the lady said at the counter, no, that you found that. That's yours. Keep it. So she took her $20 and the $10 that she had promised to give to the Lord, she gave to the Lord. She gave towards missions giving. Another time she was um, worried about how she's going to pay for her missions giving. So she prayed and said, dear God, uh, provide, please provide. So she turns around from that prayer. And not too long after, she got a letter in the mail from the grandparents. And each and every one of the grand, um, grandkids, the grandparents had designated an allowance. Hers was $5. And she took that $5 and she started rejoicing. Her mom said, what are you, what are you doing? What are you, why are you so excited? Why are you so happy? She said, because the Lord answered my prayer. She said, what do you mean? She said, I was short $5 this week on my missions giving. I didn't have enough money to give towards my missions giving. And I prayed and asked the Lord to give me the money. And, and, and grandpa and grandma gave me the money in order to give to my missions giving. You say, Christian, I, I, you might be discouraged. Christian, you might be heavy hearted. Christian, you might be uh, struggling with something. Here's the principle. Keep praying. Keep praying. Because uh, I still think that God is on the throne. And if he's still on the throne, then I know. And, and I know that I know that I know that he still has the power to move mountains. He could still answer your prayer. Uh, letter number two, I want you to see this. It's a picture of God's amazing power. I just read a book on fasting. I gave it to Mateo. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of Esther. Uh, Esther's people, Esther's tribe, Esther's race was condemned to death. That was a, um, another holocaust waiting to happen. But what did they do? They got down on their knees and they fasted and prayed for three days. And she had the courage and mustered up, mustered up all the strength to look at the king and say, King, I know uh, this is um, uninvited. King, I know this is not my place in order for me to speak. But I want to tell you this, that my people are condemned to death. And she did something that was bold and brave. You say she wasn't able to do it by her own power, by her own strength, or by her own might. But she was able to do it by the power of prayer. Here's the picture. Here's what I want you to see. It is uh, the, the, pow, uh, the, the picture of God answering prayer. The picture of God's amazing power. Uh, the widow with the last meal. The Bible shows us that there was a widow with her last meal. And, and she was going to fix her last meal right before she was supposed to die. What did she do? 
until the end, she goes and she says, okay, let's fix this. And uh, me and my son, we're going to eat this last piece of cake that we can have, and then we're going to die together. And the man of God comes into the scene, and he says, woman, fix me some food. And she said, all I have is this last cake, and I was just going to fix it for me and my son. But you know what? I'll give it to you, man of God. So she goes, and, and it was all the food she had to keep her and her son alive. Somewhere deep inside her heart, she found the grace to live. So uh, Elijah took the, pre- the, the bread that they depended on to live. And, and, and he ate that bread, and he turns around, and, and that woman ended up surviving. And the Lord provided uh, all the meals in her barrel, even much so than, than she can ever imagine or think. You say, why? Because prayer. God still has the power to answer prayer. Lastly, number letter number three, let me say this. It is a picture of the Christian's needs. We have mountains in our lives that need to be moved. We have mountains that I, I, I'm pretty sure that I don't know anything about in your life. We have mountains that we're facing in our lives that, that um, they're, they're so drastic, they're so big that I don't even comprehend or understand. There's people here in this room that are weary, wounded, broken, and battered that are facing so much that only God knows about. But here's the principle. You can take that mountain and you can give it to God and He can move it. He can soothe it. He can cast it into the sea, the Bible says. It's a picture of not what I've done, but what the Lord has already done for me. You say, why do we keep praying for Miley? She's sick because I believe still that the Lord can answer our prayer and restore her health and her strength. Let me close with this illustration. A good friend of mine, Pastor Tyler Golden, Church Street Baptist Church out in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Great preacher. Uh, when he was a young man, his, uh, he, he grew up in a, uh, with a single mother, and she took care of him and his sister and, and their family. And, and Brother Tyler got to a place where he was helping to provide for the family. He had decided in his heart, no matter where everyone else was going, he was going to serve the Lord. Every time that there was a church work day, he was the first one to volunteer and said he was going to help out at church. When there were things that needed to be done at home, he had the character enough to say, I'm going to take care of it and helped his mom as best as he possibly could. He would go to the to, to, uh, uh, school in the mornings and in the afternoon. He found part-time jobs to help provide for his family. And, and when he wasn't doing anything around the house or for his family, what he would do is he would turn around and help at the church, wherever needed to be done at the church. He decided in his heart that he wanted to serve the Lord. Um, Nearing the end of his high school tenure, he turned around and he said, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to go to Bible college. And he put that on his list of things that he wanted to do in order to serve the Lord. He said, and and note this, you don't have to go to Bible college to serve the Lord. He just said it's something that he believed that God wanted him to do. And so he wrote it down and he said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to provide, but you provide. And so he started going to Bible college uh, after he had graduated and he worked hard in the church and he turned around and he did the best he could uh, to serve the Lord uh, continuously and to try to pay his bill. And in his uh, last semester, he got a call from the church office of the Bible college and they said to him, uh, Tyler, come to the office right now. And so he went over to the office and they said, you're not going to be able to graduate if you don't pay your church bill. If you don't pay your school bill, you won't be able to graduate. So you need to get on it. And Brother Tyler started heading towards home and he started thinking to himself, Lord, how are you? How are you going to pay for this bill? Because that's your bill. It ain't mine. It's yours. And he said, I, he said, he started thinking of the ways that God was going to provide. He got home and he thought to himself, "Uh, I'm just going to continue doing what God told me to do. I'm going to be faithful. And so he turned around and was about to leave the home to go to church to do some work. And his pastor calls him from church and says, Tyler, my office, 430 sharp, hangs up the phone. His pastor never talked to him in that manner, in that way. But he said, man, something's big for pastor to tell me that. And as he goes into his pastor's office, he goes over to sit in, uh, in the office. He sees his mom over there across. And he goes up to his mom and he says, mom, what are you doing here? She said, I believed I needed to come because Pastor called me and said, my office 
4.30 sharp and hung up the phone. So him and his mom met up together right in the front of pastor's office and they walked into the office and they both sat down. And she looked at uh, pastor and he looked at pastor and pastor said, uh, come in. And uh, another older gentleman came into the room and he sat down. And uh, let me tell you two things about Brother Tyler. Brother Tyler loves Chick-fil-A. If he's not at home and he's not in the church or he's not doing visitation and doing some things for the church, you'll find him at Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A was his hot spot place to go, his favorite place to go, and so you'll find him there. The second thing you got to know about T Brother Tyler in this story is he uh, was owing uh, $10,000, over $10,000, $10,050 in order to cover his three years of what he had owed for the Bible college. So he's there sitting in the office, and the pastor looked at him and said, Brother Tyler, uh, this man wanted to talk to you. And an older gentleman in the church looked at him and said, Son, I've been watching you. I've been watching you since your daddy left and how you took care of your mom. I've been watching you when I knew you were tired and hurting. You'd come to church and you would cut the grass and you would clean up and help out at church. I watch you take your sister when no one else would take your family to church. Take your family and you would come to church and you're faithful to the Lord. I watch you throughout high school and throughout college. I'm getting emotional because I remember the first time I heard this story, Brother Tyler told me this story. And he told me, always remember, God will provide. He told me that. But the man sat into the room and he said, I, I watch you as you were going through Bible college and I believe that God told me to do this. And actually his bill was $10,043. $10,043. And the man hands him a check and he says, I want you to take this check and I want you to go pay your student bill. And so he took that check and headed over to the the the. the the, uh, the, to the Bible college and he went over to pay his bill and he's got a big smile on his face never even looked at the check and he leans over to the, the secretary and she says are you ready to pay your bill you've been avoiding us all this time and he says yep I'm here and she said how much are you going to pay he said I'm going to pay it all in full she said what he said I'm going to pay it all every last dime I'm going to pay in full and she said how are you going to do that? And he pulled out the check and he handed it over to that lady and it was $10,050 and his school bill was $10,043. And she crunched out the numbers and uh, gave him a receipt and she said, well, at least the Lord provided and even more so. And he said, nope, the Lord provided exactly what I needed. She said, what? He said, the Lord provided exactly what I needed. He took that $7, went over to Chick-fil-A, and he had paid exactly what he needed to get a Chick-fil-A sandwich, $7. You say, God knows your needs. God understands what you need, Christian. So what do you need to do? You need to look at that mountain that's in front of you. You need to look at the things that you're facing in your life today. And instead of giving up, instead of quitting on the Lord, realize the power of God. You can move mountains by prayer heads bowed eyes closed father thank you for this morning lord thank you for this time that we can look at your word lord i man i'm honored to be able to preach your word i want to thank you for each and every one represented over here father thank you for noah coming out lord anti monk mateo the stevens father uh, the danners uh, kaho ali's father the child's lord uh, kiabu's father miss lisa and miss maddie father Thank you for our wonderful church. Thank you for the ability to come to church this morning. Lord, I don't know why you gave me this message this morning. I was looking at this and I thought to myself, man, I don't need to move a mountain. But I want, when I realized the principle you were trying to teach, the depth that you, almighty God, would identify with me, that you would love me enough to not only save me, keep me, and use me, but you would be give me the power to move mountains if I believe. W what a phenomenal thing. And Lord, I pray that your Christian here, your Christians here this morning would, would see the power of prayer. That as they move out throughout this year, that they would continue to pray and bring and uplift things to you in prayer. That they would not worry about their needs that you've already provided and taken care of their needs. That you would continue to show your mighty hand and your mighty works, Lord. 
I pray this morning that anyone here that has not accepted your, Christ, uh, your, your son Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. Father, not only that, I pray this morning that um, whoever here is struggling with things that they don't understand and they don't know why, I pray this morning that they would continue in a, in a mindset of prayer, that when they're discouraged and when they're hurting and when they're in pain, that they would realize that you are the potter and they are the clay. And the clay doesn't need to try and work on itself but they can lean on the potter. Father, they can lean on you, the creator of the universe, the giver of eternal life. Father, and they could be strengthened in knowing that you've already provided and sustained their needs, Father. So, Lord, this morning, as we go back to our respective homes, I pray that that your word would settle in our hearts, that it wouldn't just go from one ear out the other, but your word would settle in our hearts and make us better, stronger Christians for you, that we would leave here, Lord, with that unbelievable mindset, that we wouldn't be discouraged about the person that we're praying for, that we would continue to pray for uh, one soul, Lord, to get saved this year, Father, that we would continue to pray for Miley, that we would continue to pray for each other's needs, that we would continue to pray that you would provide and you would strengthen. Lord, thank you for all that you do and who you are. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. Lord willing, we'll see you all Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. God bless.